Okay, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Right, I'm Mel Bell. I'm chair of the Menhaden Board, and uh, we'll call the uh, Menhaden Board into uh, order. Uh, so welcome. We've got a fun, action-packed agenda today, literally, um, and uh, we're already 45 minutes behind or so. <laughs> so my my objective is to get us finished here without having to order out for pizza, okay? Uh, I'm sure they have good pizza here, but I don't want to do that. All right, uh, first uh, item on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Do any of you have uh, suggested changes to the agenda? I have one. Okay, I'm going to, uh, we, we have one uh, topic that we will discuss that has no action items, and that's a uh, briefing on the stock assessment. Uh, Dr. Amy Schuler, uh, who graciously came up from Moorhead City, has to drive back to Moorhead City but as soon as she's finished. I'd rather not keep her here late, so we're going to move her first uh, in terms of when we get to the items on, on the agenda. Uh, so that'll be one change to the agenda. Okay, uh, any objections to that? I don't see any, then that stands approved. Uh, next would be approval of the proceedings from the May 2022 uh, meeting. Are there any edits or changes necessary to the proceedings from May 2022? I don't see any hands. So then the, uh, the proceedings will be approved then. Okay, uh, it takes us to public comment. Again, we're running a little late, but I know we have public comment uh, in person and I think online as well. What I'd like to do is limit it to three minutes uh, for each individual. Um, we can start uh, either online or in person, whichever's easiest, maybe. Okay, uh, okay, well. We have somebody in person that would like to go first. Uh, I'll go first. Oh, we're going we're gonna to do in person first and then we'll jump to the online. Okay, I, I, um, I'm surprised you called me so quickly. Um, so my name is Peter Himchak and I work for Omega Protein. And uh, we, we are getting to the point where um, it's becoming intolerable to see the same public comments coming to this management board every time it meets. And the particular comments um, only come from a few individuals. There are some form letters or uh, there are petitions now being circulated. And uh, there is always this uh, accusation of um, overfishing Menhaden in Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we're threatening the forage base of the predators. And we would like to see some of these statements backed up by scientific fact or a publication. Uh, we rely on the ASMFC and it's technical scientists that are exploring the spatial component of the BAM. Uh, we've supported them through the ERP process and we will consider to support them um, in whatever direction they go from here. But this whole issue of uh, Chesapeake Bay, um, we, we hope it stays in the domain of the ASMFC scientists. And just because you are constantly flooded with faxes and articles and letters, et cetera, et cetera, that talk about how we are crippling the forage base in the Bay, uh, we hope that we, we'd like to see that uh, some uh, bait to some extent. Um, we get tired of reading it, and you may as well. We hopefully you do as well. So until some science comes along, um, I I I just can't stand reading the same comments over and over. And I hope you feel the same way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your comments. All right, we'll shift over to online. Uh, first, I have. Uh, 
Phil Zelzak. Phil, if you'd like to go first. Three minutes. Uh, yes, board members and the representative of Omega Protein. Uh, my name is Phil Zalzak. I'm a recreational fisherman in Southern Maryland. It's time to shut down the last remaining Atlantic Menhaden reduction fishery on the Atlantic coast. As the overharvesting of Atlantic Menhaden is destroying the future of striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay and beyond. Allocating 71% of the total allowable catch of Atlantic Menhaden to a Canadian reduction fishery, Omega Protein, is of no benefit to American fishermen or American taxpayers. That's a total of 136,313 metric tons, or over 653 million fish per year, allocated to less than 300 workers in Reedville, Virginia. And the corporate profits go to Canada. This is truly stupid. I call it the Canada First policy. To add insult to injury, the board annually allocates 51,000 metric tons of Atlantic Menhaden, or 244 million fish to omega protein, to be harvested from the Chesapeake Bay. That's 26% of the total allowable catch for the entire Atlantic coast. That's obvious overharvesting and violates common sense and is doubly stupid. These allocations violate the mission of the U.S. Commerce Department, the goals and objectives of this board, and the fishing regulations of Virginia. These allocations are not an equitable allocation of a natural resource to all user groups. They are based on political science, not biological science. The commission lowered the total allowable catch of Atlantic Menhaden from 216 metric tons to 194,400 metric tons to decrease the mortality rate of striped bass. Did you hear that uh, represented from like a protein? And I'll send you the references. But this board has done nothing to protect the striped bass in the Chesapeake Bay where striped bass feed and breed. Finally, it's time for the board to live up to its goals and objectives to the benefit of American fishermen and American taxpayers. It's easy. Just do the damn job. I thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Phil. Next is Tom Lilly. Can you hear me now? Got you, Tom. Okay. Uh, I'd like to try and answer Mr. Hemchak's uh, uh, Omega Protein's objection. Sir, the commission ERP work concluded that the commercial harvest should not exceed 4% of the stock. If it did so, it would damage the uh, Manhattan and in turn would damage the striped bass. Because as you know, the main conclusion of that study, sir, was that striped bass were the most sensitive fish to Manhattan harvest. Mr. Hemshack, how can you assure the public that you are not taking more than 4% of the Menhaden present in the bay? Because from all the observations that we have seen, there are many days that your ships can't even locate any Menhaden, substantial number of Menhaden in the bay, because you have harvested all of them. So please advise the public how you can assure them that you are not catching more than 4%. Can I have a little more time to give my statement, please? No, stick to the time, Tom, and also please address uh, the commission. You're not here to address anybody else, okay? Please. Okay. The Chesapeake Bay spawning stock has failed. Three years of the worst, the young of the year ever. So shouldn't the Menhaden be board, board be looking at the location of the harvest? The poor condition of Chesapeake Bay and fish wild, and wildlife is a call for the following. That the board determine the ecological, social, and economic consequences of moving the factory fishing out of Virginia waters into the U.S. Atlantic zone compared to leaving it where it is in the bay. This action is supported by the Maryland legislatures, legislators that represent over a million Marylanders by charter captains, 10 statewide fishing clubs, and the Maryland Sierra Club with 70,000 Maryland members. In Virginia, as you know, a petition has been filed by the Theodore Roosevelt Partnership that represents over 100 organizations, CCA, Virginia Saltwater Sportsmen, 
and the American Sports and Fishing Association. There has never been a time where the damage being done to Chesapeake Bay and fish, wild, fish and wildlife and the interest of millions of people by the reduction fishing injury was more, fishing industry was more obvious. And there has never been a time where so many responsible organizations are requesting the Ben Aiden Board to act. We say that a lot of people say that you will never face up to your obligations and your responsibilities to wildlife and the people of the Chesapeake Bay, protect American jobs and resources. We say our Manhattan delegates care about Maryland, about our communities, about American jobs, that they will act to protect and enhance Chesapeake Bay experience for millions of our fishermen. And these are our deserving caregivers, our veterans, our disabled, our retired, there are millions of these Maryland families and children that find a special happiness together enjoying the wonders of Chesapeake Bay, as Sierra Club put it. The people and their representatives have done everything they can do to convince the delegates, the Menhaden delegates, especially the Maryland delegates, to carry out their duty at this meeting. We will know shortly whether this will happen or not. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom. And we also have your written comments as well. Uh, I have one more, at least one more online right now. Robert Newberry, if you'd like to take three minutes. Robert, you should be able to unmute yourself now. And to unmute yourself, you just need to click on the microphone button. It is red now and it should turn green. Hold on, all right, one. Uh, staff who is muting, if you could stop, I'm gonna try to take control to see if I can help him. All right, Robert, try now. And again, just click on that microphone button. And Robert, you're just self-muted. Okay, I think we're having some technical issues. Um, can't successfully unmute. It's uh, Robert, it's on your end to unmute yourself. Again, you click on that microphone button. It is red right now. It'll turn green when you're unmuted on your end. Okay, I think we're, uh, we've got some technical issues here with uh, unmuting Robert. So let's go ahead and um, move along in the interest of time. Um, so the uh, first item will be Dr. Amy Schuler, who is, Uh, we're going to move along. Yeah, we, we're uh, we're just going to keep moving here. Um, yeah, Amy is uh, was the chair of the uh, Menhaden Stock Assessment uh, Committee, and she's going to brief us on the uh, just it's just a briefing, no action here on the on the assessment. So, Amy, take it away. Good afternoon, everybody. Happy to be here and talk about the update assessment for Atlantic Menhaden. Um, I guess I'll first off start by saying that it, you may have noticed that the report looked a bit different than it has in the past. It was a modified report for updates called a term of reference report. And so as I go through this presentation, I'm basically going to go through each of the terms of reference that were in that report and hit on the sort of highlight items from that report. Next slide, please. So the first term of reference was to update fishery dependent data, including landings, discards, catch at age, et cetera, that were used in the previous peer reviewed and accepted benchmark stock assessment. Next slide, please. Um, basically, I'm going to just talk about the, the landings, all of the other data pieces there, for example, catch it age, et cetera, were updated, but I'm not going to go through the nitty gritty details of all of that. Um, so I'm starting off with, this is a time series of the reduction landings 
um, in thousands of metric tons over time from 1955 to 2021. The boxes are colored north in the dark and south in the light. So you can see which uh, reduction landings were attributed to the southern area and the northern area. Um, to remind everybody, the landings are split at Machapungo Inlet with those landings in the bay being in the southern region. So overall, landings have declined over time and are clearly limited by the coastwide tack in the more recent years. Next slide, please. Um, we also updated the bait landings. This is bait landings in thousands of metric tons for the same time period. Again, south is in the white and north is in the darker color. Uh, notice the scale difference here. Um, I do have a, another slide sort of showing total landings with both combined. One thing of note on this slide is that there's this sort of um, change in the er, or mid 80s, so sort of 1985 um, to 1990 time period compared to the last benchmark assessment that is and was addressed in this update assessment through a bridge run, um, particularly the states are able to update their landings data from 1985 to the present based on information that they have. And there were some updates that were done um, since the benchmark assessment, which changed the landings time series. And so it's best scientific information available and it is the most accurate landings time series. And we addressed it through a bridge run, which I will talk about in future slides. Next slide. So this is the total landings coastwide uh, for the duration of the time series. Um, in this particular slide, the sort of dark gray color is reduction and then the black is the bait plus the recreational landings over time. This just gives you an idea of the scale between the fisheries and that um, the bait and reduction or recreational landings are becoming a bigger proportion of the total landings as we're moving into the future. Next slide, please. So for term of reference number two, it is to update the fishery independent data. So the abundance indices and then the associated age length data um, that were available um, that were used in the previous accepted benchmark stock assessment. So next slide. Uh, we updated all of the indices. This is um, a picture of the index for the young of the year or recruitment index. In the past, we may have called it JAI, Juvenile Abundance Index. So if, if you've been around a while, you've heard this called JAI, YOY, Recruitment Index. It's all the same thing. It's very similar to uh, what the index looked like during the benchmark assessment um, with just some minor nuances. Next slide, please. In addition to that, we also updated the adult abundance indices, and I've um, included the table here for these indices. Uh, we have termed those indices the NAD, the MAD, and the SAD, so sort of northern, mid-Atlantic, and southern adult indices, and they are based on different sets of data. And I really put this up here just to talk about uh, which data sets go into which of these indices. So the NAD is com um, a combination of Connecticut lists, the Delaware Bay adult trawl, and the New Jersey ocean trawl. The MAD is the Maryland gillnet with the VIMS shad gillnet. And then the SAD is the North Carolina P915 CMAP and the Georgia EMTS. The, the other reason I put this up here is just to show that not all of these surveys had data for 2020 and or 2021, which is a common thing that I'm sure has been discussed at multiple boards um, or anywhere that's dealing with data regarding anything really, um, because there is just um, a lack of data in some years. And so um, I say all that um, to say that the, Stock Assessment Subcommittee still determined that there were sufficient data to update the indices through the terminal year of 2021. Um, each one of these data sets at least had one um, data set that went through the terminal year, and so we went forward and, and updated them. Next slide, please. 
So I put those three indices on one slide here, the NAD, the MAD, and the SAD, just to give you guys an idea of what they look like. We'll see them again later on, um, but they they generally were um, fairly similar. Um, I guess nothing nothing stood out as as a concern. Uh, also in the lower right hand corner here is the updated um, MarMap and Ecomon, or I've called it Mar Echo in a lot of places, just a combination of MarMap and Ecomon. Um, it's a another index that was included during the benchmark assessment and the stock assessment subcommittee censored it from this update assessment for various reasons which i will get to in future terms of reference next slide please the third term of reference was to tabulate or list the life history information used in the assessment and or model parameterization so things like natural mortality start year, maturity, sex ratio, and note any differences um, from the benchmark. Next slide, please. So there weren't any notable differences from the benchmark. In fact, I don't think there were any differences from the benchmark, the, um, except for the change in the terminal year of the assessment, which is why we did this update to begin with. So the model years include 1955 to 2021. The plus group was six plus, so the model represents ages zero to six, with six being a plus group. There are two fleets in the parameterization of the model. There are a, There is a bait fleet and a reduction fleet, with each of those being split north and south. So two fleets, yet four different time series of landings and age compositions. Fecundity was time varying. Fecundity at age, which was updated um, this go around using the exact same methods used in the benchmark assessment, uh, which were done by VIMS. Maturity was time varying maturity to age based on the time varying length at age information. The sex ratio was fixed at one to one um, for males and females. And then the natural mortality vector was based on a scaled Lorenzen uh, using the tagging data analysis done by Lil Gestrand et al which is what we did during the last assessment as well. Next slide, please. All right, term of reference number four. This is probably where I'm gonna spend like the bulk of the presentation, I guess. Um, it's to update the accepted models and estimate uncertainty, including sensitivity runs, retrospective analyses, um, and compare them with the benchmark assessment results, including bridge runs um, to document any change from the previously accepted model. So this update assessment had basically two changes that were um, decisions made by the stock assessment subcommittee. Um, all of the data were updated through the terminal year of 2021, but we did censor two items. The first is, we excluded the 2020 Southern Commercial Bait age compositions. And I put this um, figure in here as sort of our, um, just to show why we did that. And I'll give a bit of an explanation. So for the Southern Commercial Bait fleet, there were few samples taken for ages. And of the samples that were taken, I think all of them were age three. So Basically, the age composition for that year looked odd compared to other years just because the sample size was very, very low. And so you can see on this um, figure, on the bottom uh, part of this slide is something called the CORR. That's the correlation between the observed and predicted data. And so we want our predictions to be as close to what we observed in the catch it age as possible. And you'll notice for 2020, there's this little red circle with an X through it. And that means we're doing a horrible job predicting uh, what the age compositions look like for 2020. And that's because they were all age threes, which doesn't really match with the surrounding years. And it doesn't match with the estimated selectivity that we are um, estimating within the model. And so 
we censored those data. We did a number of runs looking at how to handle data from 2020 and 2021 with respect to the age compositions. And all of that is in the report. A lot of it's in the appendix. So if you want to look at that in further detail, you can. Uh, the second change that we made was the exclusion of the MAR map ECOMON or the MAR ECHO ichthyoplankton index. In particular, this index, um, I'll talk about it more um, later on in this term of reference four, but the inclusion of this index was causing problems with, and I'm putting this, I don't know, if, if you don't run statistical catch at age models, maybe this is too much lingo, but the Hessian didn't invert and we had a high gradient. So basically what that means is the model didn't do a good job finding that sort of place where everything matched up cohesively within all of the data sets. It didn't know what to do because it couldn't fit that data set with the rest of the data in the model very well. And I'll show some more um, slides about that in a little bit. Next slide, please. So I just have a couple slides for what the base run looks like here. So this is the um, full fishing mortality rate over time for the base run of this update assessment on the um, left. And then on the right is the full fishing mortality, but broken up by fishery. So each of the colored um, bars represents one of the fleets. And so you can see here there's um, reduction north, reduction south, bait north and bait south. And um, the red and green are the reduction fleet, and then the blue and pink is the bait fleet. Next slide, please. I also included in here um, the recruitment and the spawning stock, which is the fecundity value. Remember, the spawning stock biomass for Atlantic Menhaden is based on fecundity and numbers of eggs. So on the left and here is the recruitment time series as estimated from the update assessment. It looks very similar to what we've seen in the past, um, but adds a few, a couple more years on. Um, one thing about the recruitment um, estimation is that uh, typically, statistical catch at age models have a difficult time estimating recruitment at the end of the time series because there's little data informing it because it doesn't have that full age composition structure to, to inform whether or not it was a big recruitment class or not. And um, in particular, that's an even um, less data in this case because the terminal year is 2021. And so we're missing some data for 2020 and 2021. And so what the model what ends up happening is sort of you end up at your median value. Um, for the figure on the right, that's the spawning stock biomass over time. Uh, that Remember, that's in fecundity or numbers of eggs. Next slide. So that was an extremely fast like what the base run looks like in a nutshell and then now i'm going to compare it with a few different runs that may be of interest to the board um, the first one here is a bridge run i already mentioned that the uh, bait landings for the northern commercial bait landings changed in 1985 in that mid 80s section and so we did some runs to look at whether or not that had an impact on the overall outcomes of the model. And so this is the geometric mean fishing mortality rate for ages two to four on the left, and then the fecundity values on the right. So those are our um, metrics by which we're looking at for the benchmarks. So that's why I included those. And you do, if you look in the mid 80s, you know, you see a little bit of deviation from um, the benchmark. So the benchmark assessment is in green on here. The update base run is in black. And then the red is using the, the commercial, northern commercial bait landings from the last assessment. So overall, I would say that this wasn't a, a huge change, even though it does look like the landings changed quite a bit in some of the other figures. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so these next two slides are looking at comparisons of the update assessment, which is in black. So it's sort of um, black with black circles. It's underneath a lot of the runs that are on here um, with the benchmark, which is in that cyan blue, sort of that lighter blue color with a bunch of different runs looking at how to handle the, the um, 2020 and 2021 data. So the, the red run here excludes uh, 2020 Okay, excludes the, I can't read this on my slide or screen very well, um, but each of these runs excludes 2020 or 2021 data in different ways. And that's described in the, in the report. And basically we're looking at what are the impacts of that on this assessment overall. And mostly, as you would expect, the impacts are in the uh, last few years of the time series and um, generally they're not big impacts and I say that because this is going to be within the uncertainty analysis runs that we did and so this is for the full fishing mortality time series on the left and then the geometric mean fishing mortality rate for ages two to four on the right next slide and then on the left here is the recruitment time series. And then on the right is the fecundity time series. And so you can kind of see here that depending on the assumptions you make or which data you use for 2020 and 2021, that has an impact on what's going on with recruitment. So are you informing um, recruitment at the end of the time series with those age composition data or not? And um, so, I say all that because in the stock assessment subcommittee discussed this, there's just some uncertainty about the recruitment. Um, it's one of the things that we're always uncertain about. So um, just something to keep in mind. Next slide, please. All right, so the other um, difference between the benchmark and the update is the use of this MAR map or MAR echo um, index. And so the ultimate result was that the stock assessment subcommittee decided to censor that index, although we did make recommendations to explore it further in the future. One thing we did do was we compared our benchmark from the last go around, which is a black line here, and our update, which is also a black line, uh, with a different terminal years for that MARMAP, Ecomon, Ichthyoplankton Index, and those are the different colored lines here. And basically, um, in the early part of the time series in the 80s, the um, lines are pretty much all on top of each other, but as you go into the more recent time series from 2000 on, that index is having a difficult time um, increasing at a rate at which the observed data are increasing. So if, if you look at this slide on the left here, that is the observed index, which is the black open circles, and then the fits to that index are the individual lines. And so there was a lot of discussion. There's some discussion in the report with respect to this. We plotted uh, this plot on the right here, which is the fecundity in red, which is pretty flat, versus the um, observed MAR map or Ecomon ichthyoplankton index in black with the black open circles. And then in the blue open circles is the predicted index from the model. And the reason we plotted this together is because this index is an index of fecundity. It's, it's basically an, a larval ichthyoplankton index, which we matched with fecundity. And some of the discussion that was had within the SAS was that there's a lot going on between um, when spawning stock biomass is defined versus when the larvae are counted. And so I think, you know, we're maybe missing some of the interactions that are occurring there, and, or maybe there's some non-linearities that we didn't account for, which is why we made a research recommendation to look at this in the future and consider some different options, such as changes in catchability related to the index um, over time. Next slide, please. So just to show you the impact that this 
exclusion of this index had compared to the benchmark. We have on the um, left here the geometric mean fishing mortality rate for ages two to four, and on the right is a plot of the fecundity over time. The uh, black line on the top here is the benchmark assessment. The black line underneath all of the other lines with the black open circles, you can see it in some places, is this update assessment. And then all of the different colored lines are running the assessment with different terminal years for that ichthyoplankton index. So we put this up here to basically show that the impact on the overall outcome of the assessment isn't significant. And so we do think that this was a reasonable decision to make given that this was an update and that we need to do some um, further work to look at this index in the future. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the other um, typical analyses that's done for an assessment is something called a retrospective analysis. And so that's when we're peeling off uh, terminal years of data to look at the impact of those terminal years of data on the overall assessment outcome. And so the base run is in black here with black open circles, and that goes to the terminal year 2021. And then um, each of these colored lines says retrospective with a year. That's the terminal year for that retrospective run. And um, this is showing geometric mean fishing mortality rate for ages two to four on the left. And then on the right is the fecundity over time. Generally, we want to see an even dispersion of those terminal year points above and below the line. Um, the, the SAS did caveat this analysis given that there were, um, with 2020 and 2021, there were some data missing and it wasn't as uniform or as representative in some cases as it has been historically. And so you sort of take this analysis with a bit of a grain of salt. That being said, this um, retrospective analysis looks pretty good and it would be within the um, bounds of the uncertainty analysis that I'm gonna show next. Next slide, please. So we did run the Monte Carlo bootstrap ensemble analysis, so the MCB or the MCBE analysis, and we ran it exactly the same way we did for the benchmark assessment. So we included the exact same uncertainty components, which were um, in particular, natural mortality and fecundity, I think. And so I just showed a plot of recruitment here, time series, and the black circles with the black line is the base run of the update assessment. Underneath of that in this slide is a dashed black line, which is the median of the runs. There's 4,000 some runs contributing to this figure. And then the gray shaded area is the fifth and 95th percentiles of those different uncertainty runs. So just giving you an idea of the um, range of recruitment uncertainty. Next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to, whoops, can, can we go back one slide? Thank you. So this is a plot of fecundity over time on the left and then the geometric mean fishing mortality rate for ages two to four on the right. This slide is set up the same as I just described for recruitment. So the base run is the black um, filled circles with a black line. In this case, you can see the black dashed line under there. That's the median of all those uncertainty analyses runs. And then the gray again is the fifth and 95th percentiles of those runs. Okay, next slide. All right, so that was term of reference four, which basically tried to quickly walk through the update assessment itself and then the things that the stock assessment subcommittee um, discussed at length during our meetings. And so I'm gonna move on to term of reference number five, which is update the biological reference points or trend-based indicators or metrics for the stock and determine stock status. Next slide, please. So this figure is one that ASMFC uses and we updated. This is the fishing mortality, and in particular, it's the age two to four geometric mean fishing mortality rate, which is the fishing mortality benchmark that we use based on the peer review. Um, 
And so that is shown over time here in green. And then we have the two um, reference points. There is the ERP target is the blue solid line. And then the ERP threshold is the blue dashed line. Uh, the management board moved forward with using the ERP targets and thresholds. And so that's what we are basing our stock status on. And as of right now, the um, fishing mortality rate for 2021 is below the ERP target. Next slide, please. Okay, and then the alternative reference point is fecundity. This is in quadrillions of eggs. So the green here is the fecundity value over time from 1955 to 2021. And then the solid blue line is the ERP target, and then the dashed blue line is the threshold. And we've been above the threshold for fecundity for uh, a number of years, and then in the most recent terminal year, the uh, fecundity value is above the, the ERP um, target and the threshold. Next slide, please. So, the question is always, well, what does this look like compared to, you know, our uncertainty analysis? And so we did not run every single version of this model through and get an ERP with every single um, iteration of the Monte Carlo bootstrap runs that we did, but we are comparing this just to give like an indication of what, um, the time series look like with respect to those reference points. And so on the lower or on the left here is the fishing, the geometric mean fishing mortality rate over the uh, ERP threshold. And so we are below that and all of the runs in the uncertainty analysis were below that. And then on the right is the fecundity time series over the uh, fecundity uh, threshold. And so in the terminal year, um, the, the majority of those runs were above that, which is where we would like to be. So next slide, please. So stock status with respect to fishing mortality rate and fecundity. So the F for 2021 over the F threshold, um, remembering that this is the ERP threshold is 0.28. And then the F2021 over the target, again, the ERP target is 0 0.85. We want those values to be, well, we want the value with respect to the threshold to be less than one. The value of the target is sort of the purview of the management board and their risk. For fecundity, the fecundity value in 2021 over the fecundity threshold is 1.76. We want that value to be over one, and we are. And um, then for for the target, we're also above one, which is 1.28. So for the stock status, we are not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. And just to reiterate, this is with respect to the ERP benchmarks that um, were adopted for this species. Next slide, please. Okay. Term of reference number six is to conduct short-term projections when appropriate and discuss assumptions um, if they're different from the benchmark. So um, next slide, please. Projections were run. We gave one example. We used the exact same methods as in the benchmark assessment. And we projected at a tack of 194,400 um, metric tons, which is the current tack. We use the exact same allocations, pretty much just showing you what it looks like if you stayed with status quo with the expectation that you will request additional projections to be run for your consideration. Um, but the SAS not wanting to guess at the possibilities of what those could be. So just providing this as a kickoff point for you guys to then make some decisions about what you want to see for projections. Uh, to remind you, during the last benchmark assessment, we moved towards using a method called nonlinear time series analysis for projecting recruitment. And that is basically using the time series of recruitment and its internal coherency to predict forward what we expect the recruitment to be in the future. 
So we maintained that for this assessment and um, just to sort of reiterate, we moved to that method because it showed that we, we did show that Atlantic Menhaden had good internal consistency within its recruitment time series and then it was able to predict forward fairly well and it actually ends up giving us a, a little bit smaller confidence intervals on our recruitment projections than what we had been doing in the past. Next slide, please. So this is the projections at the current TAC of 194,400 metric tons. In the upper left-hand slide is the fecundity in billions of eggs. In the lower left-hand side is the fishing mortality rate. In the upper right-hand side is recruitment, and then the lower uh, right-hand side is landings. Landings is one straight line at 194,400 metric tons because we're specifying that. In the other figures, you see several black lines. The black dashed line is the median or 50th percentile across all the runs for the projections. The dashed lines are the 25th and 75th percentiles. And then the solid black lines are the 5th and 95th percentiles. And then in the figures on the left, there is an orange line, which is the ERP target for fecundity and fishing mortality rate, respectively. And then the, the blue line for the um, threshold is on there too. So you guys can see sort of where you are with respect to that target and threshold. And so when you look at this for 2022, if you are catching what you caught um, this last year, you have the same tack, you are below the fishing mortality rate target and you are above the fecundity target for 2022. And as you move forward in time, you get closer to that target. Next slide, please. All right, term of reference number seven is to comment on research recommendations from the benchmark and note if there's been any progress and if we have any further research recommendations. I tried to keep this short, they're in the document, um, but I'll go through a couple that were sort of highlighted. Uh, next slide. So the first was to develop and implement a coastwide Menhaden-specific multi-year fishery independent index of adult abundance at age with ground truthing for biological information. You guys, if you've sat at the table for any length of time, know that we've asked for this over and over and over again. Um, so Congress did include a Chesapeake Bay Atlantic Menhaden abundance provision in their fiscal year 2022 Consolidated Appropriations Act. So there's some movement happening at a higher level. Um, Mike Wilberg did a project to evaluate potential survey designs for the aer an aerial hydroacoustic survey within the Chesapeake Bay specifically. However, no funding's been attached to these projects and they remain unimplemented. But there has been some forward movement on this, which is um, nice to see. Next slide, please. Okay, um, continue current level of sampling from the bait fisheries, particularly in the Mid-Atlantic and New England. That is a wish um, from the Stock Assessment Subcommittee. We, we, we're noting here 2020 and 2021 had reduced sampling. Everybody knows that because of the um, global pandemic. Um, but the SAS does not expect that this will continue past the pandemic. So we do expect as, as we're moving past 2020 and 2021 that the levels of sampling will um, increase and we hope to see them increase even more. Um, let's see, conduct an aging workshop to assess precision and error among age readers with the intention of switching um, the bait fishery age reading to state aging labs. Uh, this was discussed during the last benchmark assessment with the intention of having an aging, an in-person aging workshop. Again, this was postponed due to the pandemic, um, but there is still a, a want and a need for this to happen. So it's still on the list. And then I just made a note here. These are just a couple that we picked out to present, but there's a full list of research recommendations in the report itself. So next slide, please.
Okay, so that runs me through all of the terms of reference. And so I basically just have this slide to um, start hopefully discussion and uh, about what the board would like to see for projections and what they'd like to request for their next meeting. So in the past, the board's request some options uh, similar to what's up here. So this is, um, you guys have requested based on a percent increase to the TAC or decrease to the TAC of some percentage, usually 10 to 40% increase, and what do the risks look like with that. You've also um, requested based on some percent probability of exceeding the threshold or target, um, what would the landings be or what would the, the TAC be? And so the example here is an example of 50 to 60% probability. So if I wanted to exceed the ERP target or threshold, that's your choice, by some amount with some risk level, what, what are we looking for? And so I put this up here as just a cue to, to you guys as to sort of what, what would you like to see for projection runs. And then next slide is, I just have a slide here for any questions on the presentation, of course, and on the assessment itself. All right, thank you very much. That's very detailed, and thank you for the work of the, the subcommittee and uh, and uh, all you've done. So, first of all, any questions for Amy? Claire, okay. It's Allison Colden. Yeah, with the mask, too. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I will echo um, thanks for your presentation and for your work, Amy. Um, I just have a question on the projections for recruitment. Um, so it looked like recognizing, too, that you mentioned during your presentation that recruitment is one of the trickier aspects um, that you guys are working on within the assessment. It looked like for um, the top end from the median up um, for those projections that there would be um, a decline in the out years of recruitment under the existing or the current TAC. Um, can you comment on that at all, or do you have any indication of why that might be expected when it looks like the the fecundity and the um, the abundance were within the uh, the ERP target and threshold levels? Yeah, that's a good question. So. The way in which the recruitment is projected is it basically takes the the terminal year and it says, okay, I'm in this state space. That's what it's saying. And then it says, what other points in the past have been in this similar state space and where do they go? And so what you have at the end of the time series is you have points in a certain state space and they're moving in the same direction. And then you have a new point. It's gonna do that every single time. And so I guess my statement is just, it's because of where the state spaces are forcing it to go as it's moving through time. And I, you know, I don't know that I have a, a super satisfactory answer besides that. Um, I will say during the benchmark assessment, we did this moving window analysis of this method and we projected for 10 years, like, you know, we peeled off time and said, okay, if we were projecting this from you know 1995 or something forward how close would we get and we did pretty well so i mean it's just using what i'm calling that internal consistency within the recruitment time series and that's where it's putting you based on the state space of those recruitment points all right any other questions yeah, Connor. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the presentation and um, nice work to the assessment committee. Um, just to follow up on the Ecomon, um, like, so it sounds like the recent years caused challenges for fitting of the model, and um, it, the hypothesis is that there's a misalignment, perhaps, of spawning in the survey. Um, I guess, did you look at the sampling intensity or sampling periods to see if those differed from previous years to kind of test that or is it could there be other things like reduced larval production perhaps or uh, different spatial mismatch and where the sampling's occurring and where 
um, um, their spawning. Yeah, I'm just conferring because I can't remember <laughs> every fine detail of everything. So 2021 was missing, um, but the rest of the years were similar. Um, and it isn't just a phenomenon in like the last couple years since the benchmark, um, meaning there's there's an uptick in the larval index from, let me look at the figure. Where's that? So, looks like from 2010, 2012 on, there's this increase in larvae over time. And, you know, we, because this was an update, we didn't have a ton of time to explore what would be going on there, but we did discuss it. And what's happening is the model has one sort of catchability coefficient for that whole time series. And so it's having a hard time estimating that value while also trying to get an uptick in the in the index given that the fecundity information or estimation is still relatively flat but variable and the fecundity is informed by that index but all the other data com components and pieces and so there's some like incongruity between sort of all those other pieces and and this piece and so uh, we need to figure out what that is and we did have a discussion about why that might be and there's a lot of different possibilities but we weren't necessarily able to rule them out given the time frame of the update and so that's why we made a research recommendation to look into it further and um you know keeping in mind that you know, this is one data set in a whole group of data sets. And when we did uh, run this assessment without the index and compared it with the benchmark and um, this current update, there wasn't extreme differences in the overall model outcomes. So I hope that answers your question. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, just trying to think through how missing surveys difference in timing of sampling from year to year may impact the ability for the model to fit the data. So thanks, appreciate it. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Amy, for this presentation. I'm not entirely sure where this question belongs, so just please put it off or if it's not in the right place, but it really is about the projections, which it looks like are through 2026 based on the current ERP. So my question is, the next ecological reference point up bench or update is scheduled for 2025, I think. So I guess my question is, what are what are the conditions under which those ERPs that we're projecting against might change? And when might they change? And what what would be sort of what would be the scenario where they would be lower or be higher? So that maybe we can just have that in the back of our mind when we do our projections. I mean, I can speak to that. I don't know if it's my place, but you're right. The next benchmark assessment for Atlantic Menhaden is in 2025. So, I mean, one of the things we do discuss is how many years to project forward and what to provide. Um, and, and you guys can do with that what you will, right? So if the expectation is that you will be delivered a, an assessment in 2025, I mean, let's face it, the, the real expectation will probably be winter meeting of 2026 by the time you would get it. Usually that's what happens. It comes in February, I think. So, I mean, my expectation would be you would use this through 2025 and then 2026 is a question, right? What what are you gonna do? But I mean, these are projections for you guys to use to inform your management decisions and you know, you can take them how you will. All right, other questions? We can shift to the question you had for us, I guess, guidance, guidance for the 
committee assessment folks in terms of uh, coming back to us with future meeting yeah megan thank you and thank you amy <clears throat> um yeah i had some i guess suggestions for different projections to look at and based off of lynn's question um I guess they would be for 2023, 2024, and 2025, but I think the board would still have the option at the next meeting to only set for two years if we so chose. So I, I guess I'm asking for three years, acknowledging that may not be what the board ultimately chooses. Um, I think you've already done one of them, which is our existing TAC. Um, I'd be curious at a five and 10% increase in the TAC. And I'll just note the 10% increase, I think is 216, which is what we were at a few years ago. Um, and then kind of the other style of projection, looking at a 40, 50 and 60% probability of exceeding the ERP target. And I think in the last round, we saw those um, as individual years. And then also there was a run where they were all combined. Uh, and I found that really helpful. Uh, so if that's possible, I realize that's probably more work given it's three years. So feel free to comment on workload, but um, I found that comparison really helpful last time. Thank you. All right, thanks for that, Megan. Any other suggestions, desires of the board? For... Okay. Let's see. Uh, yeah, and I've got... Uh... Okay, Nicola, want to go? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I agree with Megan's suggestions and was just going to ask that the um, probability based projections be at the 5% increment, not 10%, um, which is similar to the last time we asked for projections. Thanks. And I had another hand. Yes, ma'am. House. Yeah, similar to our last round of projections as well, um, I was going to ask if we could do the 5 and 10% below the current TAC for completeness and so that we can see the, the full range above and below the existing TAC. Thanks. Okay. Tom? As in the last couple of years, stimulating my thought, I'm trying to think if there's any speculation of what climate change is doing with the Menhaden population. Because I look at nursery areas, we know it's affecting striped bass because of the warming of the waters. We know it's affecting other species like that. And do we have any idea, because as the bays and estuaries warm up and we have more algae and plankton blooms, will there be any effect on the Menhaden? Or we have we seen any? Other, other ideas, suggestions? Yeah, Kristen? Yeah, so in the previous benchmark, we did, uh, Rob Latour did an analysis versus a habitat analysis with all the data from the indices that we used and looked at salinity profiles, temperature, and kind of graphed ideal ranges for Manhattan based on the data that we have from our surveys. And we did not redo that for the update, but we could look into doing that again for the benchmark. And that at least gives us an idea of um, where Menhaden tend to be in which ranges and where we are currently. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Anything else? Yeah. Can we get uh, just a clarification from one of Megan's requests where, so you had asked for looking at runs that would give you a 40, 50, and 60% chance of being at or above the ERPF target. And you had said we could do that for, do it for in each year. So we would have that, which would give you a variable tack every year. And then for sort of a one year or like one tack option. And so the question would be, obviously you're going to get, as recruitment comes in and goes out, you're going to get different percentages if you keep the tack the same. So when you say you have like a 40% chance of being at or above that F target, do you mean in that first year, in the last year, in the middle? Yeah, I mean, the maximum tack for those three years that keeps all three years at the 40% or 50%. So all three years would have no more than a 40% chance of being at or above the target. 
yeah, all three years would have no more than a 40% chance of exceeding the ERP target. So I just wanted to clarify too, you want me to cut 2026 off? That would be my recommendation. Okay. I'm not comfortable at this point setting attack for 2026. That sure. seems pretty far off. I can do that really easily. All right. And, oh, okay. And online, Rob LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, agree with the idea that we take a look not only at going up higher with the tech, but also taking a look lower. I do think that's very beneficial. And I, and I think what I just heard about the idea of, of trying to take a look at some of the habitat impacts and some of the ecological aspects, I think makes a lot of sense. So thank you. All right, thank you. Anything else? Got a good list there? <laughs> yeah, we're just conferring with one member to make sure we didn't miss anything. I mean, I'll, I'll summarize. So <clears throat> it looks like well, clearly 2022 is going to be projected at the current TAC. And 5% increments. Okay. I can't read that. So, and then we're looking to um, project for 2023 to 2025. Um, plus and minus 5% and 10%. So in 5% increments around what 194.4 is um, for those three years. And then we're also looking for a 40, 50, and 60% risk of exceeding the ERPF target for two different options. One, for the individual years, so variable TAC. And then two, for all years combined, um, where the max, we're basically looking for the maximum TAC value that keeps all of the years below that target, per, target risk percentage that we stated. Okay, so we want 40, 45, 50, 55, 60. Okay. Did we capture everybody's requests? I don't see any hands. I see a lot of head nodding. Good, good job. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Do you need anything else from us then? Okay. All right. Then, uh, then we're concluded with this particular item. So thanks. Thanks so much for all the hard work again, the subcommittee, and and uh, for being here. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, folks. We'll move along then. Uh, so we're going to go back to the. Uh, Original, I think it was item number four on the uh, agenda, which would be consider fishery management plan review, state compliance for 2021 fishing year. And James Boyle is gonna walk us through that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice to be here in person with everybody and start putting some faces to email addresses mostly. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go through the 2021 FMP review and a lot of it will seem familiar from the data update I presented in May. So I'll probably try to go pretty quickly through some of those sections. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So here's a quick overview of the presentation. So I'm gonna start out with a very brief reminder of the status of the FMP with last year's TAC, although we did get reminded in the last presentation as well. Um, since we just had the presentation of the stock assessment update, I have omitted the usual status of the stock section of the presentation. So I'll be able to move on straight to the landings information that I presented in May, and then the compliance requirements and PRT recommendations. And then I'm gonna to return to the landings information at the end because uh, I have an, a bit of an update with validated landings and the discussion around that should apply both to the FMP review and possibly the addendum we talk about later going forward as well. Next slide, please. So just a quick reminder of the FMP, uh, Amendment 3 approved in 2017 and implemented in 2018 is still the most current management document that the fishery operates under. For notable changes from 2020, the Chesapeake Bay cap was returned to 51,000 metric tons as outlined in Amendment 3, and the total allowable catch or attack for the 2021 and 2022 fishing seasons is set at 194,400 metric tons based on the board approved ERP ecological reference points or ERPs. Next slide, please. 
the 2021 landings, this is the same as I, sh as I showed in May. Uh, the total landings, including everything directed EESA and incidental catch or small scales fisheries landings amounted to 195,092 metric tons or about 430 million pounds, which is approximately 6% higher than 2020 and 0.36% over the TAC if incidental catch was counted against the TAC, which it is not. The non-incidental catch, so if you take those catch, the incidental catch landings out, is at 189,343 metric tons or 417 million pounds which is also a 6% increase from 2020 and about 97% of the coastwide TAC. The incidental catch on its own is 5,750 metric tons or 12.7 million pounds, which is a 9% decrease from 2020. Um, also, I don't have a slide for it, but I'll throw a quick note in that I presented the quota transfers to be 17 in May when it's between some new ones and some corrections, it's actually 25. And I bring that up because it is part of the objectives that, for the reason of the addendum that we're gonna talk about later. Next slide, please. Okay, so next to look at the reduction fishery. Again, this has not changed. The reduction harvest for 2021 is estimated at 136,690 metric tons or 301.3 million pounds, uh, which is a 10% increase from 2020, but only 0.06% above the previous five-year average. Um, of those landings, about 50,000 metric tons came from Chesapeake Bay, which is approximately 1,000 metric tons below the Chesapeake Bay cap. Next slide, please. This figure shows landings from the reduction in bait sectors over time. Uh, the reduction landings are on the left-hand axis and bait landings on the right. Note the different scales. So the reduction landings are an order of magnitude larger than bait landings. Uh, the overall trend is still reduction landings declining, bait landings increasing. Um, although the 20 to 20, 2020 to 2021 uh, differences are slightly against those trends, but overall the trend is the same. Next slide, please. Uh, breakdown of the incidental catch over time. As I mentioned previously, the total was 5,750 metric tons or about 12.7 million pounds, which is a 9% decrease. There were six states that reported incidental catch from 2021. That's Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey. 88% of those landings came from purse seines and 9% from gill nets. And the state of Maine accounted for 96% of the total incidental fishery landings in 2021. The incidental catch trips were lower than in 2020, but still higher than 2016, 2016 through 2019. Next slide, please. In the episodic events set aside, there were three participating states, Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. Their total combined landings were 2,213 metric tons or 4.9 million pounds, which was over the total set aside by 592,250 pounds, but a few quota transfers and donations at the end of last year and then earlier this year resolved that, so there was no overage going into the 2022 fishing year. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving on to biological monitoring requirements, which was not presented in May. We have the non-de minimis states are required to conduct biological monitoring based on their landings as well as their geographic region. So from Maine to Delaware, they required one 10 fish sample per 300 metric tons. And from Maryland to North Carolina, it's one fish, 10 fish sample per 200 metric tons. In 2021, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut fell short of their required samples, although I have some explanations from the compliance reports here. Uh, so Massachusetts received a number of quota transfers to extend their fishery on August 5th, but then were not able to complete the additional monitoring before it closed again five days later on August 10th. Um, in Rhode Island, some late reported landings pushed them up from the four required sets to, or sample sets to five. And so they only got the four 10 fish samples, but they did note that over those four events, 55 fish were sampled from the fishery, as well as an additional 49 from the coastal trawl survey. Uh, Connecticut has long faced difficulties collecting bait samples, and they rely primarily on their Long Island Sound trawl survey for sampling, which produced 103 age samples and 302 length samples over 139 toes. Next slide, please. Uh, the de minimis requests were the same as last year. So as a reminder, to be eligible for de minimis status, a state's bait landings must be less than 1% of the total coastwide bait landings for the most recent two years. The states of Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida all requested and qualify for de minimis status for the 2022 fishing season. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the PRT recommendations, the PRT continued to discuss a topic that was brought up uh, last in last year's FMP review, whether a sufficient number of samples are being collected from different gear types and regions. 
and whether substituting from fishery independent sources is appropriate for meeting the requirement. Um, so the PRT reiterated its recommendation to reevaluate the sampling requirements and requested the board to, or suggested the board task the technical committee with conducting a review of the requirements. Now, having said that, after the PRT made that recommendation, uh, we had a discussion with the we the policy staff, not not the PRT, had a discussion with the science staff, and we went ahead and put the put that request to evaluate it in the draft terms of reference for the benchmark stock, stock assessment in 2025. So you should be, or within the next six months or so, those draft TORs will be presented to the board. So we've gone ahead and done that. Next slide, please. So with that, the actions for the board today are to approve the 2021 FMP review for end state compliance and approve the de minimis requests for Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And next slide, please. And so that brings me to the, the landings discussion. So the information I just presented comes from the state compliance reports. Um, but because it's an assessment year and because the board requested 2021 landings in the addendum, the data were validated in time for this meeting. Now, most years, data are not validated on the state-by-state -state level by species and go through the normal ACCSP process. So this slide shows the differences between the validated landings on the left and the compliance report landings on the right. From the validated figures, the total commercial landings, including directed incidental catch and EESA landings, are estimated 195. 195,481 metric tons, or about 431 million pounds, which is approximately 6.2% uh, above the 2020 values, and 0.56% over the TAC, again, if incidental catch was counted against the TAC. The non-incidental catch fishery landings uh, are, for, are estimated 189,500 metric tons, or 418 million pounds, which is 6.6% increase from 2020 and represents about 97.5% of the coastwide TAC instead of 97%. Uh, landings from the incidental catch fishery in total are 5,981 metric tons or about 13.2 million pounds, which is still a 5.5% decrease from 2020. So for context, out of the 15 states that have their data validated, so for example, Pennsylvania is excluded because they don't have any landings. Out of those 15, six matched exactly between their compliance report numbers and their validated numbers. The differences varied from as little as one pound to more than 7, 700,000 pounds. And the biggest difference for an individual state was 3.5% from compliance report to validated landings. Um, so I'm bringing this up here because how the board chooses to address this issue or not um, affects both how we monitor for compliance and calculate overages and possibly how we set allocations depending on the options chosen in the draft addendum coming later. So one suggestion that came from the PDT, not the PRT, because we first discovered this issue working on the addendum, is to move the compliance report deadline later. So on April 1st, when compliance reports are due, some states are still working with preliminary data, especially on the specific like gear type level, on the very small levels. Um, and moving the deadline could improve accuracy. On top of that, staff was reviewing Amendment 3, and the timing of validated landings data does not line up with the payback provisions in Amendment 3 very well. So while the amendment says that overages need to be paid back in the subsequent year following the overage, so if you have an overage in 2021, it needs to be paid back in 2022, what we found out is that final landings aren't really ready until midsummer. So you could have a situation where states need to remove quota in the middle of a fishing year. Um, so as far as the FMP review is concerned, we recommend the board consider moving the compliance report deadline later, possibly the summer, like July 1st was the example we picked. Um, and then as we pivot to the addendum discussion, staff will be recommending a new option for the addendum that opens paybacks to the following year after the subsequent year. So if we find an overage based on validated data in the middle of the year, states can pay it back in the next year if needed, so then they can plan for having that less quota in their fisheries. Next slide, please. Are there any questions? Thank you. Yes, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for that report. Just out of curiosity, did you reach out to the states who had the largest differences um, in the, between their validated, you know, their two sets of data to see if moving the deadline would help them or if, if it was some other issue for them? We did reach out to a lot of the states that had some of the biggest differences, especially in working to create the tables in the addendum to make sure they were accurate. Um, and especially also because normally the validation process doesn't break the, the landings down into categories. So we needed that as well. Um, and I do believe they said that that would be a significant help, I believe. 
Uh, we didn't discuss it specifically. I did have a conversation with one or two states um, earlier on in the compliance report process, in particular those states that do not have their landings divided up by gear type early on and they can't provide that, all they can provide is a total. And those states had said that a later date would be beneficial to them. And the PD, several PDT members did say that it would be helpful. So I guess then the question is, is there interest uh, from the board in, in moving the, uh, the date for the compliance report, Chris? And then Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think I heard it correctly. Uh, the proposed compliance report date you're thinking of moving it to is July 1st. Is that it? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think any any push uh, later in the year will help uh, the, the final landings. The only thing I would, I guess, consider is the number of other compliance reports that are also due on July 1st. You know, you have you know, staff you know internally review a lot of these before they. It gets sent to uh, to ASMFC. I think uh, I think the matter would be six that are due on July 1st. So I don't know if if June's workable or if August is too late. Um, but just something to keep in mind as far as if we decide to move the uh, compliance report due date for Manhattan. Thanks. That's a good point, Chris. Megan. Yeah, I mean, I I I think it may be prudent to move it back. I think that would help several states. And um, James just. Uh, to help you a little bit, I my recollection is having a month to compile the FMP review from 15 states is a lot of work and a little time. So if you choose July 1st, you're setting it up for the same kind of situation where the first week of August is when you have to report out. So I don't know if June 15th might give you a little extra time unless you uh, have a different system you've set up. But my recollection is that was always really tight. Yeah, Tony, you want to weigh in here? Our intention was to not provide a um, FMP review until the annual meeting if we switched it to July 1st, Megan, just because of what you said. And I just did a quick count, Chris, you are correct. We currently have six compliance reports due on July 1st. This would make seven. If we did it in August, if we had August 1st, that would make um, a total of four due then. And we have, and that would be the same for June. It would make a total of four due then. So, and I think if we did August 1st, we would still have enough turn time to provide the compliance, the FMP review at the annual meeting as well. Okay, so August 1st is kind of, anybody have a problem with August 1st? It's my birthday. Just thought I'd mention that. See what I did on my birthday this year. <laughs> okay. Do we need a motion for that or just general consent to? Okay. Everybody good with that? We will move uh, the compliance report from Manhattan to August 1st for all the reasons we just discussed. Okay. Well, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I guess we probably wouldn't need a motion for that. Yeah, to uh, accept the uh, yeah, accept the compliance reports. Is that motion prepared? I'd, I'd be glad to make it. Yeah, I, I think Maya prepared a motion. Ah, yeah, there the magic, mysterious Maya. <laughs> there we go. Do you want to read that? Or sure I can thing. read it. Sure. <laughs> go um, ahead. Uh, move to approve fishery management plan review state compliance reports and de minimis requests for Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida for Atlantic Menhaden for the 2021 fishing year. Okay, that knocks out two things. One there, yes. Is that a second, Pat? Pat's, Pat uh, seconds. Any discussion of that? Any objection to the motion? Tony? Mr. Chair, since Maya's not here, I just, okay, just wanted to make sure she knew it was Pat Gear. Okay. Yes. All right. No objections to the motion? All right. Motion carries. Great.
Does anybody need a break? Okay, I don't see any hands. If I can, if I can do this, you can do it. <laughs> All right, takes us to item five. Considered. <laughs> now we're going to get into draft addendum one to amendment three. So we've got some unfinished business there we need to clean up, right? Uh, James will walk us through that, and there. Hopefully, this will go smoothly. Thanks again, Mr. Chair, and uh, yeah, I'll just get jump right in. Next slide, please, Maya. Okay, so a quick outline of the presentation. I'm going to give a very quick overview and recap of the process that we've gone through until this point, and then I'm going to move on to covering the contents of the draft addendum. As in previous meetings, I'm going to go section by section and pause for discuss discussion and motions at the end of each one. So first the allocations, and then the ESA, and then the incidental catch, those will all be done separately. Uh, so the goal of today's meeting is to finalize the options in the document and consider approving it for public comment. Um, additionally, going off what we discussed just now at the end of the FMP review, staff is recommending adding language in the addendum that will allow for overage paybacks in the year following the subsequent year from the overage. Next slide, please. A quick recap, uh, the board initiated the development of draft addendum one in August of 2021. The first draft was presented to the board in January of 2022, after which board comments were incorporated into the document and presented again in May, where the PDT received further, edit, further edits that are included in the version presenting here today. Ideally, the document will be approved for public comment today and hearings will commence from August until October and the board will consider final approval in at the annual meeting in November. Next slide, please. So like I said, to help work through the addendum, we're gonna take each section at a time and consider board action specific to each section. Uh, as a quick note, there were two options, two sub options removed between briefing materials and supplemental materials. Um, so the total is 33 options, not 35, as is written in the document. Um, there's only one option remaining that the PDT specifically recommends removing, uh, but any additional options the board would like to remove will always help ease the process going forward, presenting it to the public. Next slide, please. So first up is allocation. The objective of the options in this section are to align with the recent availability of the resource, enable states to maintain current directed fisheries with minimal interruptions during the season, reduce the need for quota transfers, and fully use the annual TAC without overage. Next slide, please. So the PDT used the same two-step approach as outlined in Amendment 3. So first, we're going to consider the fixed minimum allocation step, and then second is allocate the remaining TAC based on the timeframes. Um, before I start going through the options, the tables that are associated with each combination of the two steps are in the document, the draft addendum provided in supplemental materials, if anyone would like to compare. And then I have them in the presentation here, but I, I think it's easier to see them in the document. So we'll just skip through those when I get to the slides of that. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the fixed minimum approaches, we have the status quo option of 0.5% to every state and a three-tiered option that would have different minimums for different groups of states. The PDT developed the tiered option to reduce the amount of TAC that was reserved for minimum allocations while still allowing for states to acquire the necessary allocation when combined with the second allocation step. Under the status quo option, 8% of the TAC is apportioned out through the fixed minimum, and under the tiered option, that would be reduced to 5.53%. Uh, the three-tiered option contains that still contains the changes made by the board at the January meeting, of course, and the PDT previously voiced their concerns over that but have no new recommendations regarding those options. Next slide, please. Moving on to step two, option one, options one and two are fairly straightforward. They are the average landings from each of those listed timeframes, the current one being 2009, 2011, is the status quo. And I'll add a quick reminder that at the last meeting, the board voted to replace 2020 with 2021 landings and all of the relevant options. So that's reflected up here. For the weighted timeframe allocation, the PDC still recommends removal of timeframe number two or option three B. The board requested two versions of the weighted allocation timeframe to be, be developed in October of 2021. While the state allocations vary slightly between the two versions, by expanding the range of years by one, they are conceptually the same. So the PDT reiterates its recommendation that timeframe number two be removed because the same objective is achieved with timeframe number one, which utilizes the original time series that we use now and then adds on the most recent three years. Next slide, please. So then we have option four, which is the moving average option. In response to board concerns in the January meeting about the types of landings that can affect the moving average, the PDT split option four into three sub-options, two of which remain after the May meeting. 
So option 4A represents the original moving average method that includes all catch types, including episodic events, set-aside landings, and incidental catch or small scales fisheries landings uh, to most accurately reflect the distribution of stock and effort. The PDT continues to support the retention of this option as is the most responsive to the current fishery, but if the TAC has exceeded, it could impact states that use their full quota. Option 4B only uses landings under or equal to the TAC in the moving average calculation. So this option recognizes the importance of incidental catch, small scale fisheries landings, and episodic events landings in a state's total landings to reflect stock distribution and as a way to move averages up if needed. However, it does not reward states for activities that could lead to overfishing, such as exceeding the TAC, and it does not damage existing markets in other states by, for example, shifting quota away from states that fully utilize their allocation. Uh, proportional allocation of the incidental catch and ESA landings among participating states eliminates concerns about the timing of, or availability of when fish become available, so it's not a uh, first come, first serve situation. The PDT supports the retention of this option as it adds protections for states that fully utilize their fishery, but is not as representative of the current fishery as an option 4A. Due to the fact that in 2021, incidental catch landings put the total harvest above the TAC, this was the first time we could utilize the calculation to only count a portion of those landings. And so there's a full explanation of that calculation in the document if you'd like to see it in more detail. Next slide, please. So here we are, we've gotten to the tables. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them, but otherwise they're the same as that have been presented before and have been in the document before, except with the update of replacing 2020 landings with the validated 2021 landings. So I think Maya, we can go ahead and skip to slide 16, please. Which brings us to the end of the allocation section. Are there any questions? All right, that's simple. <laughs> any questions at this point? Oh boy, I don't see any hands. So we have some, we have recommendations from the PDT. The only one. Well, yeah, okay. So there is the PDT uh, recommendation that we have, and they have been consistent. Maya, do you want to put that slide back up? I think it was yeah. on the... It's slide number eight, please. We're in the um, PRT slide uh, presentation somehow, Maya. Thank you. And again, remember the what we're doing is just approving for <laughs> taking it to public uh, comments. So there'll be much more time with this. But uh, the PDT has been pretty consistent in their appeal for some simplification if we can. Joe and okay, Joe then Cherie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And I think the PDT has really gotten this document to a a, a really an impressive place and um, I've been fighting to keep option 3b in um, it's more inclusive of data you know there's a lot of interannual variability in the landings for this species I don't think it makes this a more complex document slightly larger with more tables but the understanding of it's just it's a it's a different set of years not any older data just more inclusive um, I, I I would like to see it stay in. So Joe would like to see it stay in. Uh, well, Cherie, you're next. You don't have to <laughs> comment on that if you don't want to. Well, actually, I was going to um, agree with the PDT and recommend that it be removed. Um, I think that there's just a, um, a lot of similarities to it, and and there there's not much difference. Right, and they pointed that out, I, I think, consistently to us. So, someone in favor, someone take it, uh, put it in, leave it in, take it out. Any other thoughts on that? All right, well, we could, someone wanted to make a motion one way or the other. I guess we could do it that way, or 
Here, Sheree. I'd like to uh, make the motion to remove option 3B um, under 3.1.2. Oh, shall I, I'm sorry. Move to remove option 3B weighted allocation time frame number two from section 3.1.1 in draft addendum one. Thank you. You're going to get a second. All right, anybody want to second that? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> okay. Ah. Kurt. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Is that a second? Okay. Yes, Kurt Coleman. Okay, we have a second. Good. So we have a motion. Then we have discussion of the motion. And Maya, that second was Chris Kuhn. Oh, Chris. Sorry to jump in also. My, my mistake in drafting the motion is 3.1.2. Yeah. Okay, so we'll correct that. Thank you, Chris. That's a long way over there. I can't read. <laughs> okay. Discussion of the motion. Are y'all kind of quiet? <laughs> Well, we could vote on it <laughs> if there's no further discussion. Is that Dennis? Emerson. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree with uh, with Joe. Um, so I'm going to vote against this. this I, be, I, I would not support this motion. Um, I would support keeping it in the document. Um, and let's see what the public has to say. Thank you. All right. You may like to speak the other direction. All right. Not allowed to. Yeah, go ahead, Tony. I just point out that if we do remove this option, it takes us from 16 to 12 allocation options that the public would have to to weigh. Which I think from the beginning, we've been kind of having a plea for simplification. And I understand taking a large suite of things out, let them comment. But at some point, it, it I think does get a little overwhelming, I, I think, just my opinion. All right, any other discussion? So we can vote on this then. All right. Uh, all in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Oh, first of all, does anybody need to uh, caucus? I'm sorry. Yeah, caucus. All right. We'll, we'll take uh, three minutes or whatever. We got time. Magic three minute timer. Three three minute caucus. Maya, were there, while they're caucusing, I don't know. This PowerPoint is in a square. I know we talked about it before. It, I think it's the actual way we 
set the slides, so I don't know if it can be fixed. But if we can try to make it a yeah. rectangle. In widescreen mode. Okay, so we can't uh, fix it. Let me. That's fine. Try. I know what the problem is. We'll resolve it for next meeting. Do you want me to put the standard size up? No, nah, I think it, the slide gets too small if we do that. Okay. Is is it? Yeah, the slide like that you have up here right now is great. It's the presentation itself. The oh, the previous presentation. But yeah, James's presentation. Oh, okay. I think that was in standard size. Okay. I think we're good, Mr. Chairman, according right. to Rhode Island. We've finished caucusing. Good deal. All right. Everybody ready? All right. Then uh, all in favor of the motion, uh, just raise your hand, please. I have Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia. PRFC, Maryland, and New Hampshire. Do they miss anybody on this line? Okay. Okay. All uh, opposed, raise your hand. I have Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maine. Okay. Two abstentions, no fisheries and Fish and Wildlife right. Service. Two abstentions. So that's 11 in favor, five opposed, two abstentions, and no null votes. All right, it passes. Thank you. Yes, Megan. Just before we get off this section, I just want to provide one suggestion on uh, tweaking uh, wording, if that's okay. Um, it was on 4B, the calculation procedure for the overage. Um, and there's a sentence that talks about overages to episodic and evaluating state landings on a weekly basis. Um, and I understand that we in the FMP report our episodic landings by week, but in reality, we're reporting them by day. And I think a lot of the states are making decisions not on a weekly basis, but on a day-by-day -day basis. So for example, I, I don't assess should Maine be an episodic in week A. I assess should Maine be an episodic on Monday versus Tuesday versus Wednesday. So I was just gonna recommend that we slightly tweak that wording to consider each state's landings in day or days, but specifically each state's reported landings, because I know and I'll claim this for Maine, we've had an issue or a, like a late report come in. And so that would be counted towards the overage in using that word reported. Does that make sense, what I'm suggesting? I'm seeing head nods, so. I realize it's really specific, but I, I just think it better captures where we're at. All right. I think that makes sense. We good? All right. Yeah, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, regarding the background information for this section, um, I think there's a mistake in the number of transfers that are reported occurring in each year. Um, uh, James, I think you mentioned it with the FMP review, how there were 25 in 2021, and I don't think that's reflected in this document. Um, and then uh, with the background information for the episodic event set aside that we're going to talk about next, um, I think the count is also off for Maine and Mass with the number of years that they participated in the set aside. So if you could just double check those numbers uh, before it goes out to public comment, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Nicola. All right. Anything else? Speaking of episodic set asides, that's what we'll move to next. Okay, thanks for that. I'll double check those. Okay, next slide, please, Maya, slide 17. Okay, 
So moving on to the episodic event set aside provision, the objective of the options in this section are to ensure sufficient access to episodic changes in regional availability in order to minimize in-season disruptions and reduce the need for quota transfers and incidental catch or small scale fisheries landings. Next slide, please. So there are no changes to these options since the May board meeting. So as a reminder, option one is to maintain the set aside at 1% of the coastwide TAC, which is the status quo. And then option two would be to set the set aside at some value between one and 5% with sub options that would allow the board to decide how the set aside could be adjusted. So either as a static value during final action of this addendum or dynamically during specification proceedings. Um, then I make a quick note that's just for clarification or for information. Um, if the three, if the 0.5% fixed minimum was replaced by the three tiered minimum allocation strategy, then the minimum allocated tax would be reduced from to 5.53% from 8%, like I, I mentioned before. So that 2.47% freed up by selecting the three-tiered option will be reallocated to the, to the states. But if you increase the EESA to 2.47% or less, then you would result in a similar value in terms of pounds of fish being removed from the TAC prior to time frame based allocation, prior to the step two of allocation. That's all. Next slide, please. And that's all of this section as well. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Any desire to mess with anything? <laughs> okay, don't see any hands. All right, so we'll just hold what we've got. Good. All right. Next slide, please, Maya. And lastly, we have the incidental catch or small scales fishery uh, section, the objective of which for these options is to sufficiently constrain landings to achieve overall management goals of meeting the needs of existing fisheries, reducing discards, and indicating when landings can occur and if those landings are part of the directed fishery. Next slide, please. So in this section, there are four subtopics to address incidental catch landings. Uh, for simplicity, in this outline, I've only shown the non-status quo options. The topics include changing or proposed changes to the timing of when states can begin landing under the provision, permitted gear types, changes to the trip limit for those permitted gear types, and considering a new accountability system for incidental catch or small scale fisheries landings. Next slide, please. So to start with the timing of the provision, um, option one is the status quo. The once a quota allocation is reached for a given state, the fishery moves to an incidental catch fishery. Currently, individual states can interpret that differently. So whether they consider it an, a sector or a fish or a gear type reaches their, their allocation, then they move into incidental catch, or whether the whole state reaches an allocation and that whole state moves into incidental catch. So option two would unify it at sector, fishery, or gear type allocation. So currently, states such as New Jersey and Virginia for, divide their state allocation into sector and gear type specific allocations. Uh, this provision would confirm that once a sector or fishery or gear type specific allocation is reached for a state, then that sector or fishery or gear type fishery moves into the incidental catch provision. Option three is the opposite. Once the entire quota allocation for a given state is reached, regardless of the sector or gear type allocations, then the Menhaden fishery for that state moves into incidental catch or small scales fishery provision. Next slide, please. Section two is for permitted gear types. So in the process of editing the options, the PDT discovered that fike nets were mistakenly listed as both directed and non-directed gear in amendment three. Um, additionally, in the May board meeting, the PDT was asked to review the classification of trammel nets and consider redefining them as non-directed gear. So in options two and three, which were drafted by the PDT, fike nets and trammel nets are both reclassified as only non-directed gear. However, the status quo option must match amendment three. So underneath the status quo option, we created sub options that would present the board the chance to still choose the status quo provision, but change the classification of, the, of one or both of those gear types, if they so choose. Um, option two, the incidental catch provision would apply to both small scale directed gears and non-directed gears, but exclude purse seines. So this option is included due to the growth of directed landings from small scale purse seine gears in recent years. Uh, landings from purse seine gears would count against a state's directed fishery quota. 
In option three, the incidental catch provision would apply only to non-directed gears. Uh, under Amendment 3, this includes pound nets, anchor staked gill nets, drift gill nets, trawls, fishing weirs, fike nets, and floating fish traps, and we've added trammel nets to that as well. Next slide, please. Okay, Section 3 is to mod modify trip limits. Option 1 would maintain the status quo of 6,000 pounds per trip or 12,000 pounds for two people for all permitted gear types. Options two and three would lower the limit for directed gear types only to 4,500 pounds or 3,000 pounds respectively. So for both options two and three, the proposed change in the trip limit would only apply to small scale directed gears. Uh, those gear types are listed in full in the document again, but as a reminder, it's cast nets, traps, except floating fish traps, pots, haul seines, hook and line, bag nets, hoop nets, hand lines, bait nets, and purse seines, which are smaller than 150 fathoms long and eight fathoms deep. Uh, again, fike and trammel nets have been removed from the directed gear category for options two and three. Non-directed gears and stationary multi-species gears would still be able to land up to 6,000 pounds of menhaden per trip per day, with two individuals working from the same vessel fishing stationary multi-species gear permitted to work together can land up to 12,000 pounds. Next slide, please. Section four, the catch accounting. This section has changed significantly with comments from the uh, from the board at the May meeting. So option one is the status quo, where incidental catch or small scale fisheries landings continue to not count against the TAC. In option two, total landings under this provision would be evaluated against the annual TAC. And then if those total landings exceed the TAC, the trigger is tripped and the board must take action as specified in options 2A and 2B. Option 2A is for the board to modify the trip limit for permitted gear types, and option 2B is for the board to modify permitted gear types. Both 2A and 2B have a sub-option that would provide the board a mechanism to make a change through board action and not have to use adaptive management or create a management document. So the PDT chose to draft the option, options in this way and not to make a specific recommendation on whether the board use action, uh, board action or adaptive management because they felt it is a strictly board decision to weigh the pros and cons of those two strategies uh, for any given situation. I'll also just throw in a couple of reminders here that with regard to these options, the first is the board can always choose to use adaptive management and create a new management document instead. So you know, even if you have the power to use board action, you do not have to use it. And so there's no sub option for using adaptive management. Um, second, as in other sections of this document, the board is not limited to the options as written here and can make any combination within the scope of these options. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank the PDT for all their hard work, especially for me, uh, as I joined in the commission in January and was I appreciate their help and patience in getting me up to speed in this process. Um, yeah, thank, thanks a lot. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, so board actions to consider. Uh, consider amending the language regarding overage paybacks, as I talked about earlier, and then consider approving Addendum 1 to Amendment 3 for public comment as modified today. Next slide, please. That brings us to questions in the end. All right, any questions about all of the uh, language in there, the options available to us? And again, this is taking things out to public comment. Yes, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had a question about um, Section 3.3.4, the catch accounting provisions. Um, I appreciate the way that the PDT restructured Option 2. Um, my question is whether adopting Option 2 there, which has the trigger mechanism for when the TAC is exceeded, would remove the language that is currently in the plan about the board having the discretion if they see a non-directed gear directing or the landings increasing significantly even if the tack isn't exceeded yet to act through adaptive management then maya can you throw up the trigger slide which james will help me with which one it is 25. i just want to make sure i'm reading that's slide 25 maya please
conferring on that question. <laughs> Good one. No, I don't think so. So the wording here, we believe, means that if the trigger is tripped, the board has to act, but does not preclude the board from acting if it is not. Okay, thank you. So I guess my my hope then is that is that if the board does pick something under option two, then that language that's already in the status quo about that the board may act if they see non-directed directing, that that would be in the final document based on the answer that you just provided. Okay. Lynn and, uh, and Allison. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to recap uh, Nicola's question and the answer. So regardless of whether or not a trigger is hit, the board will have the discretion to make changes to that provision based on how gears are performing. So if a gear is really in blowing the, you know, increasing or we we maintain that that ability. Yeah. Tony. I guess Nicola, the question would be though, well, you know, what we described is true. But you collectively, we wouldn't know how you're performing in the middle of the year, and your trigger would get tripped at the end of the year. So I don't know if you would be able, like the board would be able to respond in the middle of the year to make that change. I don't know if that's what you're thinking or not. I just want to make sure. No, I wasn't thinking of that timely response, but if I if I use the last five years as an example for four years we saw a persanes directing and the landings increasing increasing and it was causing concern and we started the working group and we had this process it was only in 2021 that we actually exceeded the TAC. and so i wouldn't i don't want that ability for the board to see that i think it's the normal adaptive management process but it kind of spells it out in amendment three now like what the board can can consider if they see those you know, a, a direction under this landings happening um, or under the provision happening. So just maintaining that la that language there, I think provides the board a little bit of guidance that even before the TAC may be exceeded, they can still act under adaptive management. So it's kind of a, a option two kind of adds to the board's current ability as opposed to replaces it. All right, Lynn, did we leave you hanging? Or, or did you get did I answer your question? Okay, and Allison, did you have a question as well? Yeah, maybe just a clarifying question to jog my memory. So uh, options to address a situation in which the TAC is exceeded when the ICA SSF landings are added. Um, and so if there is another situation in which the TAC is exceeded, the overages are only accounted for on a state-by-state -state basis at this point for directed landings. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so this is the, the reason why this is, is addressing just in the cases where the incidental catch landings exceed the TAC is because otherwise it would be directed under the state landings. Just want to make sure I got that correct. Tony? There, there's episodic overages that get addressed um, through theirs, and then, and that comes out of the next year's episodic uh, set aside, and then you have your directed landings for your directed state quotas, which come back out of your state, which you're referencing. But basically, there's mechanisms depending upon where we see the overages. That right? is correct. Yeah. Okay. Just want to clarify. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, Megan. If it's okay, I had just another wording suggestion, but I can hold that if you'd like. Oh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. I realize it's not necessarily a question, but um, I guess under the trip limits and the gear types, there were sub goals, I'll, I'll call them, that were under each section. And I'm wondering if we can just add the word consider to those goals, because I think as they're currently written, they're actually narrower than the scope of options in the document. So for example, for the trip limit one, it would be limit the annual volume of IC SSF landings by considering reductions to the trip limit. Yep, 
Okay, thank you. That it? Thank, thanks. Hey, any other comments, questions, suggestions, tweaks? I don't see any up here yet. Chris, who is that? Before we go to the public, can I ask the board a question about the um, the staff recommendation to the payback provision? We figured this out after the PDT had met, so the PDT did not see this recommendation. And when James and I were thinking about it, I was like, I guess we could just add another year, but in further consideration as I've thought, I think that if the board agrees that it is good to move it back, that it should payback should only come in a single year. We shouldn't spread it out over a two-year time frame. Um, and so I'm suggesting that the option just be two years later. So for example, if we find out that there was an overage in 2021, it would come out of quotas in 2023. I just want to make sure the board is okay with adding that language to the document. Yeah, Nicola. I'll admit I haven't had long to think about this other than today, um, but I guess I'm a little bit, cons I don't like that there's additional lag if it's not needed in accounting for overages. And so I guess my question is really whether states, this has been an issue for any states that have had overages and having to account for them in the subsequent year to know if this is really a necessary change that we need to make right now and add it to the document. Yeah, Megan. I think to respond to that, Nicola, I. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, we've we've had situations where our incidental landings have changed slightly uh, from April 1st to May 1st, and I think in one of the weighted options, if those were if total landings were over the tack, those would then be used to reduce our quota in the subsequent year. And I'll look to staff to confirm that. So, I think. We may not have a final number on those at the end of the existing fishing year, if I'm understanding the option correctly, unless that is already lagged. It's already lagged, then I think it would be okay. I'm trying to remember the language from that weighted option, Megan. <laughs> Hold on. We'll answer that and then I'll get to you, Joe. It's it's lagged and it's spelled out specifically to two years, which the overage payback is not spelled out that way. Does that help, Nicola? I don't know. Is is this consideration being added because of the moving average? option or that this is a distinct issue that the the pd no the prt came up with staff came and uh, realized and is just looking to add it to here i from a massachusetts state perspective we don't have we have a relative a good enough sense to um 
handle any overage that we have in the immediate year. So from my standpoint, I'm not seeing the need for to add this, but if it's helpful to other states, I'd be willing to consider it. I just, I don't want to complicate the document with an option that we don't need if no one around the table thinks we need to address overages two years later as opposed to one year later. I can help clarify where James and I ran into this issue as we were trying to figure out the validated data and kept going back and forth with a couple of different states on the issue. We realized that a, Jeff tells me to never say data is final, but a, uh, a good value for that fishing year, it's often not going to come until sometime in the summer. And there are states that divide their quota up by quarters, by gear types um, at the beginning of the season. And one gear type may have already had their, their run. And so they wouldn't be able to take a quota overage out of that gear type and wouldn't be able to address the overage in that year. And so it would have to come out of their next year's quota in order to get it out once we told them that they had an overage because um, they would have already allocated out to their fishery. So that's why we had made the suggestion. Okay, so there's utility in leaving that in. Then. Uh, okay, Joe, you had a question? Well, I'm sure, actually, I was just going to ask Tony <laughs> to do what she just did, but it wouldn't be leaving it in, it would be adding language. Is that also correct? Yeah. And so, Nicola, we would be one of those states that Tony just created that scenario. You know, we have the capability, we have vessels that har harvest a, a great amount at one time and if one of those was missed and that overage needed to come out in the next year but we didn't know that until sometime during the year it would impact all the the allocations for all the other fisheries yeah that was leaving it in in the context of the draft where we are right now okay I'd also just like to add really quickly that the way we're going to draft the language, it wouldn't stop a state from paying an overage if they could in the subsequent year, like in the original, the year after the overage. I just suggested that we only do one year for accounting purposes. Sorry. <laughs> that was what I was getting at where I was correcting our, because I think accounting purposes, it would be maybe a bit of a nightmare if we had it spread over to, yeah, it's my fault. <laughs> Okay, and you said there was a question online? Oh. Okay, okay. All right. Anything else? Yes, Allison? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, agree and reiterate Nicola's point. Um, if there is no need for a lag, especially for a species like Menhaden, which we're managing on an ecosystem context, I would hope that we could make those changes and, and respond to those overages as quickly as possible. Um, I'm not quite sure why whatever we're discussing today would be different than how we've dealt with directed landings overages since Amendment 3. So I don't know if I'm just not following um, the issue here because we have had overages, but is it that they've always been covered so we haven't dealt with this yet? I'm, I'm not sure Yeah, Tone. what's different. Thank you. We have not had any overages, but I anticipate we are going to start getting very close to our quotas as we change these allocations and there could be overages. And because of the difficulties we had in getting a version of final landings this year, I realized that this would become a problem in the future if we had overages. Okay, so it's just thinking ahead and yeah, it's a changing field. Okay. Anything else? All right. So we're in a position where we're, yeah, so. So we have a draft of motion we could put up on the board. Um, oh, hang on, Jim Gilmore. Sorry, I was. Uh, my energy level has dropped below most of what's in the room right now. So um, this goes to section 3.3.2, um, and which we had 
it raised the issue at the last meeting, and it had to do with the uh, well, the ICSSF, the sm in particular the small scale fishery. So, um, in that scenario, <clears throat> uh, and that I raised at the last meeting was uh, New York's fishery really is a beach sand fishery now. That's what we catch. 85% of the fishery is prosecuted with a beach sand. Um, so we had, uh, I raised the point that under option three, under 3.3.2, um, if you chose that option, you would eliminate New York's fishery, essentially. Um, we've already banned purse sands. The legislature did that. So we have the ultimate small scale fishery. We're catching everything with a beach sand. Um, so we had made a request that the uh, PDT essentially fix that. And one suggestion was to add it in as a um, an option, well, under un, uh, an exemption under option three that uh, and it would be considered under a, a non-directed fishery, even though technically it wasn't. Um, I think the response that the PDT came back with was, and if I can raise it, um, hold on a second, I got it. If I can get my iPad to open up again. At the spring meeting, the PDT requested the review option three and consider creating an exception for beach saints to continue operating this option if selected. However, given that options one and two both allow for beach saints to continue under the ICSSF provision, so I agree, uh, if we pick one of those options, we don't have a problem. However, option three, the intent was to create a provision where there is no Manhattan directed fishery. Such an exception would be contrary to the spirit of the option and essentially did not have a directed fishery. I, I tend to agree with that, but the spirit of it was not to eliminate a state's fishery. So if this, um, and essentially it goes on to say that um, since because of that, that we didn't want to have a directed fishery that the PDT chose not to modify the option. So right now uh, I'm looking at this and if the PDT can't fix it, we've got two things that New York can do, either eliminate option three, which I know may give some folks some agita, um, or I have a motion ready to put up to maybe consider add or adding beach sands in under option three so that it could be considered if that option is um, if that option is selected. So if you would like me to, Mr. Chairman, I'd go ahead with that motion. Tony? Jim, you go ahead with your motion. I just would point out that New York is not the only state with a fishery that gets eliminated by option three. So there are other f state fisheries that do get eliminated and the PDT was following the direction of the board to eliminate these directed fisheries as requested. And so that is why they had the response and they some other fisheries were also eliminated by that option. So it's not just New York. Okay, so is there a, a different solution to it then, Tony? Because that, again, was the intent was not to, you know, we're, we're talking about small scale fisheries. And if that, um, it was try to restrict harvest so that we wouldn't, I mean, the whole intent of that section was that we would not exceed harvest, but now we're eliminating valid harvest so maybe there's a different way to go about doing this because all i was going to do in the motion was to add on um <clears throat> essentially uh, uh i would essentially option three and change the language to non-directed and beach sands only um then that would fix my problem but is that going to fix uh, cause other problems for other states i will leave that to the board's discussion i'm okay. just telling you what the PDT was directed to do, and therefore, that was their rationale. Allison, to that? Yeah, just a clarifying question. Um, would, wouldn't would removing it as a, as a gear under the incidental catch provision simply move those landings to directed landings? I'm not sure I understand how it would end a fishery. It would just change 
the pot under which it's accounted for. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I'm not sure. If the quota increases, yeah, I don't think it's going to be an issue. But if it doesn't, and that's what we don't know right now, then it could be an issue because if we go over, you know, our directed quote, uh, directed fishery quota, then essentially we'd be a, into the incidental catch section and then we may come up short. Yeah, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just, and, and I, I do understand the concern here, but I, I just want to take everybody back to the objective of this addendum, which is one, to align with the availability of the resource, and two, to enable states to maintain current directed fisheries with minimal interruptions during the season. And so I think, you know, looking at the tables, it, it looks like you guys are harvesting 300,000 pounds and one year you maybe had 800,000 pounds. I think we'd be better off rather than trying to craft an exception to a very specific um, piece to, to really consider when we're finalizing this document, this is the sort of thing that we need to consider it's not that much fish. I mean, I would hope that we could figure out a way so that your directed fishery isn't eliminated because that's directly counter to one of the goals of the addendum. So I don't know if that helps, um, but I, I just wanted to flag that. Well, let me let me ask Tony a question then. So the, the PDT response was something to the effect that would create some kind of a loophole, and, and that I didn't quite understand where the loophole was coming in that uh, all these states are going to come out of the woodwork now and start having big beach seine fisheries which anybody's ever tried to catch fish many with a beach seine it's not the, the most efficient way of doing it um so um what what is the loophole if uh, anybody knows from the pdt i'm going to go to uh, one of our pdt members in the back of the room and ask her to come to the table <laughs> unless james remembers but i nicole we're phoning a friend. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Um, yes, you are correct, Mr. Gilmore. The, so the concern from the PDT was that other states could then develop beach sand fisheries. We did have a conversation about it. We do recognize it is small scale. It's not the most effective method, as you said, but it still would open that door for the opportunity. And we just felt that beach sands being a directed gear we didn't feel it was appropriate to move it into the non-directed gear. We would be open to other suggestions of how to address the issue, but we just felt it was really a directed gear, so it didn't belong in the non-directed gear category. Okay. So let me let me try a motion, and uh, maybe that'll that'll help out. Oh, why not? Because. Uh... <laughs> And, and I got two different versions of this, but I'll try Emerson's suggestion first because the other one was going to be for any state that's got a beach seine fishery that hasn't banned uh, per seines, but I'll try a simpler way. So move to modify section 3.3.2, option three to three, non-directed and existing beach, uh, uh, states with existing beach seine um, fisheries. We'll put it up there and we'll let me wordsmith it a bit. Jim, we're going to probably need you to, pro let's see what Maya gets. Okay. And then slowly. Sure, I will. <laughs> I will slow down. Uh, okay. 3.3.2, non-directed. Uh, let me see. Move to modify section 3.3.2, option three. To read. Non-directed and existing or and beach sains. Let me just think. Hang on a second. Give me a give me a second, Maya. And states with existing beach sains fisheries. How's that sound? Yeah. 
Okay, so that's good yeah. enough for you. Can I get a second to that from someone? Okay, Tom had his hand up, and okay, Tom's first. Yeah, I'm tr I'm trying to get this the term straight in my mind. When I look, when because there's a whole saying, and is a whole saying the same as a beach saying? Because the whole sayings are a very efficient way of harvesting. I mean, right. think what North Carolina did on striped right. bass in, back in the 70s, and we we'll think that's why we New York eliminated the whole sanding for striped bass before it was done because it could basically see a large area. I mean, I used to drive the beaches out in Montauk and, and basically watch the whole sands load up pickup trucks with striped bass. And also what was basically kind of destructive about the fishery, it had a lot of bycatch of other fish. And once you dragged them on the beach, you weren't basically releasing them alive. So I'm I'm not sure what I'm a little confused here. So I want to know how it operates. Right. So that that wasn't a second from you then. That was just a question about uh, gear type haul because you're what you're describing hall saying. Yeah, that is in my mind a different gear from probably a beach saying I think. But uh, okay. Yeah, Joe. You you have a motion on the table, so I, I will second for discussion, and then we can get okay, to good, Tom's good. question. Okay, so Joe seconds that. Now we'll have some discussion. Jim. Yeah, actually, as Emerson and I were just looking at it, it might be easier to leave the heading alone and just add on at the end. Um, you know, the last thing would be states with existing beach sand fisheries. So um, let me change them. You want to try it, Tony? Jim, I'm not sure it should say states with existing oh, beach, okay. it should uh, just say existing beach 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 fisheries. Beach so fishery. you yeah. would just add to the gear list yes states with i'm oh, sorry <laughs> did it again <laughs> uh, existing beach same fisheries so maya we were can we can we friendly amend <laughs> so uh, move to modify section 3.3.2 option three to add or by adding sorry uh, by by adding and then take out parens non-directed exactly thank you maya Okay, Jim, is that good? As that far as that looks good. Modifying wording and Joe, yes. that was the Joe seconded. And I think um, it's yeah, Joe has a second, not Tom. Okay, then discussion of the motion, Nicola, and then Emerson, and then Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I am going to oppose the motion. Um, I agree with the PDT's rationale that this is counter to the intent of the option um i understand new york's situation i believe um but think that this option has to be taken in consideration of the other options that look at quota reallocation and um you know i'm sure we could all find one option that we we don't like on its own but it, you have to think about this in the context of what else the the addendum may do so i'm gonna oppose this thank you all right emerson Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, obviously, I support this motion. Um, and, you know, under some of the goals that we have in this document, um, one of which is to maintain current direct fisheries. Doesn't say if they're large scale direct fisheries or small scale directed fisheries, but to maintain those fisheries. That's under the allocation section. Um, we don't know at this point in time where we're going to end up with allocation. And that's some of the issue in New York, is that um, we really don't have sufficient allocation because uh, Menhaden landings weren't weren't really tracked um, until just recently in New York. So if we knew where we were going with allocation, we may not need this. But since we don't know where we're going with allocation, I, I think we're going to need this. Um, also, another goal was to uh, uh, meet the needs of existing fisheries. And as Jim said, in New York, the fishery is a beach chain fishery. That's that's what it is. And, uh, you know, they really depend on that, that um, bycatch allocation. And to answer Tom's question, 
um, the beach saying is different from the hall saying, and, and the fishery is also executed in an area and in a method where there's essentially hardly any, if any, bycatch, um, including striped bass. You know, I'm, I'm, I know the people who are involved in this fishery. I've had discussions with them several times about bycatch, and it's almost non-existent. So this is a totally different fishery than the Halstein fishery for striped bass um, that used to occur in New York. All right. To that, Tom, just really quickly. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how is it different if you basically are taking a boat and launching it from the beach and then wrapping around, or is that the way it's being done? Because that is a whole thing. So I'm trying to figure out how, and what areas are they doing this in? That's all I'm asking the question before I go. It's up in Flanders Bay and Peconic Bay. It's an area where there was never a striped bass whole thing fishery. This is not occurring along the South Shore Ocean beaches. Okay, thank you. Megan? Thank you. Um, I mean, I think I can confidently say I uh, probably best understand uh, people's concerns about reliance on small scale given where Maine is right now. And I certainly get New York's um, angst about where option three could go. Um, but respectfully, both options two and three are threatening Maine's small scale fishery, which we've become completely reliant on given our quota. Um, so I'm just getting a little nervous here that we're starting to uh, carve out exemptions for certain gear types over others. I think how the options are, are listed right now is appropriate um, and I think we should keep them that way. Thank you. All right, uh, Chris and then Cherie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I think just uh, confusion and specificity of the definition of a beach saying makes this problematic when you look across states. I, you know, I, I appreciate the definition of how the beach saying is uh, is being fished in New York, but uh, the way this is written, uh, the beach saying would be fished much differently in North Carolina um, and possibly other states. So, uh, and then if you get any gear uh, changes that are still called a beach saying you know, it can then kind of snowball on top of there. So, um, I mean, I understand New York's dilemma, but I think just the unintended consequences of this makes me uh, reluctant to uh, support this motion. Thanks. Okay, Sheree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I think this kind of, I, I completely sympathize with, with New York. Um, I know that this is going to likely affect us also in New Hampshire, um, but I think it goes against what the option is indicating. It's indicating non-directing, non-directed gears, and this sounds like a directed gear. So that's where I'm a, I'm a little confused about why we're adding something that's directing when it's under a non-directed gear provision. Mm -hmm. Thank Jim. you. Yeah, and both Shuri and Chris, you're 100% you're right. I mean, it's a directed gear. So from a technical standpoint, um, I will not argue that. From a practical standpoint, it's a you know essentially a fishery that if I go back two years ago before a legislature banned persanes, I'd have other gears that I might be able to prosecute the fishery, but I don't. We're down to it, the, the intent of this was of that legislation was to preserve the Menhaden fishery in New York and keep the population high. So we're restricted to the smallest gear possible. So now it's created this dilemma because of the name. But let me put a couple of more points in here before we vote. The one, the concern, and it's in the addendum, is that we want to prevent fish kills. That's uh, so each year for the last couple of years, we've run through our directed fishery quota and we've gone to this small scale fishery using beach sands to keep fish kills from happening. Uh, fish kills that, trust me, I've had town supervisors at meetings and I said, the fish are alive in the water, I can catch them, they're my problem. They die and they're on the beach, they're your problems. And they've been spending hundreds of thousands of dollars taking these fish off the beach. So that's 
our bigger concern about it. So yes, if our quota goes up and everything, it's not going to be an issue. If it stays the same, then I get to the fall. I've got menhaden kills all over the Peconics. We've got fish not going to market. They're just essentially going to a landfill. The guys that are doing this, and it's one guy with a, a group of people now, are catching that fish, Megan, and they're going to Maine. That's where they're selling them for the lobster fishery. So, you know, this is a, a, a practical management right now. I understand getting into, yes, it's not directed fisheries, but we're trying to get something that maintains the fishery and essentially prevents some of the other issues like fish kills and loss of a resource uh, or a waste of a resource. So, again, um, we need something better than what's in there right now. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion on this really quickly? Or, or yes. Oh, gosh. Max, I know you, Max. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to raise a technical point, maybe um, a concern about inconsistent terminology. I mean, we're hearing Hall saying beach saying. It's the first time that beach saying is even entering this document. And so if we want to keep things, you know, avoid any confusion. And if this is a Hall saying, um, as what's being described here in the small scale directed gears, maybe we should be talking about Hall sayings. It's just a I'm getting confused between beach versus hall saying, and, and I'm, if I'm getting confused, maybe some others are getting confused too. Thanks, Max. You threw me being at the table. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and uh, vote on this. All right, there's the motion. Oh, do, do you need to caucus? Yeah, probably so. Okay, let's take three minute caucus. Mike and hit the timer. We're out of time. I guess that's three minutes, folks. Everybody finished caucusing? Yeah, Jim. Um, just a suggestion because of consistency uh, in the document. Um, we've been calling it a beach saying, but we already have, which is not in the document, um, but we have hall saying that is in the document. And if they are synonymous, if we change the word to hall saying, no, all right. Tony's They're not disagreeing. the same. A hall saying is not a beach saying. Oh, no, I agree with you, but um, we never brought up, we don't have beach saying anywhere else in the document. So, um, <laughs> and we probably could have a good coffee discussion or a drinking discussion about a hall saying and a beach saying what the difference are. But anyway, all right, we'll leave it alone. Okay, Max, you have something to that? I don't mean to open up a can of worms, but with all due respect, the the small scale directed gears identified in the document does not include beach saying. So how, if we're saying they're different gear types, how is it that a state is using beach sands under the small scale directed fishery provision? I mean, I think the discussion is that they are essentially synonymous. We're calling them the same thing. Um, and that's, that's where this concern is coming from. Thanks. All right. I think we've had plenty of discussion on this and plenty of gear confusion a little bit there. Let's go ahead and vote then. All right, you see the motion to modify the, the wording in 3.3.2. Uh, All in favor of that motion, please raise your hand. I have New York. All right. Oh, All opposed to that motion, please raise your hand. I have Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Potomac River Fisheries Commission, Maryland, Delaware, Maine, and New Hampshire. All right. Any abstentions? Two abstentions. No fisheries and, and Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife Service. All right. And uh, any nulls? New oh, Jersey. Had, one null. All right. All right. What's the final score there? Okay, one four, 14 opposed, two uh, abstentions, and one uh, no. All right, so the motion does not pass. All right. Now I guess we're back to uh, a mo Yeah, we have a draft, right? Okay, we could put a motion to approve uh, this draft to move forward. Get that up there. 
Is that a Maya thing? All right, would, would anyone care to uh, make this motion to uh, approve? Oh, okay, I saw Megan's hand first. Megan? Sure, uh, move to approve draft addendum one for public comment as amended today. All right, a second, Cherie? So got a second from Cherie, all right. Let's see if we could do it this way. Uh, any opposition to the motion? Uh, or do I? Just for a Thank you. She's holding me to this. Okay. Before uh, before we vote, uh, I think we have a member of the public that would like to uh, comment. So we will take a public comment on this right now before we vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Sorry, th this will be quick. It was uh, my name is Sean Guillen. I, I work with Omega Protein, and will be doing comments on this. So it was. It's just a question about what specifically may be within the range of options in the document that could be selected. And the question is whether um, the way the document's laid out is um, advocating for allocations based strictly on current and or current and historic use um, within the range of options. That would be either without any minimum allocation to the states or no minimum allocation and no episodic event set aside. Is, is is that just purely done on the basis of current and or current historic landings within the range of options? Okay. Thank you. Question. Can you, did you get the question? Sean, I, I don't think so. The only thing that the board can choose from are within the current range of options that are in the document itself. Um, the, the document does state that you can, the board has the prerogative to cross options, um, but it has to be within the current range of options of the document. Okay, thanks, I just wanted clarification. Okay, thank you for that question, Sean. All right, so well, we actually voted we did vote that's right no we didn't we didn't vote on that we just took the other boy hey i'm losing it okay now are there any objections to this motion to adopt the draft document okay we have one objection hmm? no who that objection is new york objects yeah so just one Okay, we're good. The neck carries. Yeah, okay. Motion passes. Whew. On to public comment. <laughs> Maya, there is one ob motion carries with one objection, and then you can put in parentheses New York. Thank you. All right. What do we got left? Uh, yes, yeah, is Tina gonna do that? Or are you doing that? Or I'm here. Oh, <laughs> heard us talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have the last agenda item. We have is a uh, as a uh, advisory panel appointment. So Tina, you want to do that or be happy to. Uh, members of the board, I have for your review and consideration and approval. Uh, the nomination of Barbara Garrity Blake from Gloucester, uh, North Carolina. Her um, nomination form was in your um, main meeting packet. And All that's right. it. Thank you, Tina. So, yes, Chris? Yeah, I'll uh, move to approve the nomination of Barbara Garrity Blake from North Carolina to the Atlantic Menhaden Advisory Panel. All right, Pat, you seconding? Pat seconds. All right, any objection to the motion? I don't see any objection. Motion carries. All right, thank you. And thank you, Tina. 
Wow, I guess that's it. that's it. All right, any other business to come before the Menhaden board? Tony, could you tell us who the seconder was? Pat Gear. Thank you. All right, I got us finishing on time then. All right, well done, folks. Thank you very much. Uh, we are adjourned then. <laughs>